Good evening. Welcome to the Freedom Cinema. Look how hot James Duvall is. Still, like, still crazy. Um, who has never seen The Doom Generation before? Oh my gosh. Okay, so, weird question, but who saw The Doom Generation at the Sunset Five in Hollywood? Me! Opening the company one? Okay. Uh, my name's Logan, by the way. I'm the founder and director of the Frida Cinema. And Tim, thank you! Thank you. Uh, I should you not. Know, like, we have nine and a half years of incredible and memorable screenings and guests, but today is like super magical for me. It is a day like nine and a half years in the making. Uh, this is in my top ten. Uh, I have been wanting to play the Doom Generation since we opened, and it has not been available to screen theatrically. Um, and I am just so overjoyed that Tarion uh, has restored it in 4K, uh, has restored it uncut, so you'll know when. And, uh, and it's just, it's such a joy to bring you this movie. Um, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, uh, Film Threat had an award show here. James Duvall came out because he got an award. And I made a beeline to go talk to him, and I said, look, your movie, The Doom Generation, is so formative to me. Uh, I am still listening to that music. Half a year later, I have a Cockpit Twins tattoo to prove it. Like, I'm just crazy about 4AD and shoegaze and this movie. Uh, if we ever get a chance to play it, will you please be here? And he, yeah! Uh, you know, because it's the same as, like, it's crazy. He is Jordan. Um, and, um, and here we are tonight. So for those of you who don't know, James Duvall will be here after the film to talk about this movie. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, like, oh my god, like, I'm almost jealous if you've seen it for the first time, but I, I just want to thank you guys, you're a sold out audience, which is always a thrill to see. And look, at, I'm, I'm a film geek like everyone else, and it is always a trip when you find out that this movie, like the smaller movies that mean a lot to you, mean a lot to this many people as well. So um, it's just always great to see a sold out audience for a film like this. We have Nowhere coming up, also by Gregor Rocky, we have Mysterious Skin. Uh, we didn't realize it when we did it, but we kind of have like a James Duvall mini-fest happening too, because we have May coming up. Uh, Trevor, what's the other one? It's not LCC Punk Damn You, but what is it? May? Totally fucked totally up. Totally fucked up, thank you very much, which is also part of our Gregor Rocky Festival, so. Uh, Max, have you seen this movie? You have not? Okay, that's, you're, you're gonna, you're just gonna let it. So, um, let's get started, everyone. Thank you, thank you so very much. Enjoy yourselves, and uh, stick around after for James DeWall. Thanks. All right, first timers, what'd you think? Woo! All right, very, very cool. Uh, folks, thank you so much for coming. Join me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. James DeWall. like did the entire Q&A in the lobby, so <laughs> some of these questions might be repeated, but we'll do them again over Doritos. Hey. Yes, yes, yes. First of all, thank you so much for making it down. Um, why did it take nine and a half years for us to be able to share this film with our community? Like, tell us about the delay in getting it released, re-released theatrically a little bit. Um, well, a big part was the rights were tied up. Um, Trimark, who ended up with the rights of the movie back in the 90s, uh, I think they had a 20 year option or 25 year option. So we're at about 28 years now. So once the option went out, and all the rights went back to Craig, and then he came up with the idea that it probably would be a good idea. Actually, so I think it was Marcus, and I know I'm kicking myself, but there's another individual too who brought up the idea of preserving the film. And Greg jumped at the idea for it, and Marcus Hu from Strand Releasing made that happen. <clears throat> What's been Greg's reaction to like, so tonight, for example, while, while you guys are all here, we have uh, friends up in Sacramento who've got an incredible art house up there. They're playing Doom Generation tonight. They're also sold out. Um, you know, what has been Greg's reaction to all these screens that are popping up that are packed like this? Like, in your reaction as well. I mean, both of, I mean, honestly, both of us are blown away. I can't believe this is a full theater right now, honestly. Um, and bringing this movie back around all these years later, that, how many people here have seen Doom Generation before? Okay, wow, so that's like half the thing. How many people are here seeing it for the first time? 
That's it. See, this is what Greg and I are impressed about, is that there's half the theaters still coming back to see it because you guys love the movie, and half of you are here because you discovered it for the first time. You've heard about it, or people have talked about it, and here you are. And for the film, or anything you make, really, to be quite honest, have a life like that, is for us beyond anything we could have imagined. Because we, you know, and Greg especially, he always makes movies just on the way he sees things, the world that he lives in. And that's what I, you know, uh, Greg's, Greg's and I relationship and friendship have revolved around that we live in this very similar world together and see things in very much the same way. So, uh, it's nice to see, you know, that, you know, when you make something for outsiders because you're an outsider, because you're an outcast, and it speaks to so many of you. I think for us, again, it's, it's, it's more than anything we could have asked for. Because we were just kind of, just saying how things were for us at that time. Right on, and were you both like in that same 4AD sort of shoegaze culture? Exactly, yeah. I mean, Greg certainly turned me on to some of the creation stuff. But before that, the things that we had in common were we listened to exactly the same music, everything from the Cure and the Smiths to Skinny Puppy and Mitzered and Front 242 and we were, at the time we were heavily into industrial as you guys can tell. Um, Nine Inch Nails being another really big I think influence for us because he had just released the Downward Spiral or was just about to release that. Yeah, if you don't mind asking, how did you guys first meet? Because you became so formative, like in his films, you were like the Juliet Messina to his Fellini for a while there. Like, what is the backstory? Though? That's an interesting story. I moved. I mean, I grew up in in Los Angeles, but I moved to Hollywood when I was 18, and was just kind of loitered around this ice cream cafe, coffee shop on Melrose. And I used to hang out there before I moved there when I was in high school. You know. I, get my bi-monthly check and go spend it all at the record shop there. And I started seeing this kid hang out at this cafe that I started hanging out with after the record shops. And I'd see him there quite often, probably over the course of two, three months. And one day this kid, who happened to be Greg Araki, walked up to me and asked me if I would be interested in making movies, that he was a no-budget filmmaker, kind of like this, makes these queer John Hughes movies. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of thought, well, you know, I mean, why the hell not? I, I understand, I mean, John Hughes, I grew up with his movies. Queer John Hughes, I can relate to that too. So, um, this is original. Yeah, send me the script and, you know, see where we can take it from there. You know, and I honestly didn't think it was going to go anywhere, to be quite honest. Uh, I had, you know, I showed up to the audition and did the audition and the next thing I know he had me reading with all the other actors. Yeah. And that was kind of like, I think I got the part. <laughs> That's amazing. And like looking back to, it's, it's crazy 20 years, it's crazy to say it. Yeah. Like, it's, I can vividly recall seeing this movie for the first time, but like, um, how much of Jordan was in it? Like, was that where... You was as sort of soft and curious as Jordan, was that something that you had to bring into the character? Like, how much of, of him was reflected in sort of your own demeanor and where you were at at the time? Um, I took him from the most innocent parts of myself that I was still, I, I think there's still inherently a big part of me, but I was very lucky. Um, when we, we made Totally Fucked Up together with Greg, we shot it over six months. So sometimes we shot once a week, sometimes we shot you know, two times a week, sometimes we wouldn't shoot for three weeks. But that experience with all of us who were between 18 and 21, you know, six, six basically like teen kids and early 20 kids, we were so rambunctious and crazy and you know, we had this crazy view of the world. And I think Greg was kind of you know, taken by that. At least, you know, according to him, that became a big influence for what Doom Generation was. And, my character in Doom, he wrote specifically for me off the experiences of making Totally Fucked Up. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so, and, and Dark from Nowhere as well. Which, by the way, Nowhere is coming out later this fall. Yeah. Yeah. So we, will, we will play it as soon as we can. Yeah. We really want to include it in this month's festival, um, but we're so happy to hear that it's going to be released. And then you told me some footage, right? Extra. Yeah, uh, 12 deleted scenes. Ooh. Who's seen nowhere out there? 
All right, so if you guys don't mind, um, can we make a video to say hi to Greg? Yeah! So bright, I'm gonna stand over here. <laughs> All right, everybody, say hello to Greg Rahi. Hi, Greg! We love you, Greg. Yeah. Oh, behind us, yes. <laughs> But um, yeah, uh, let's all thank you know Greg for this because really this all came from you know his heart, and his mind, and you know we were speaking about this earlier, this crazy wild road trip that our characters go on, and it has just this dark, bleak ending, you know. But when Greg was writing this, he always knew something was going to happen to them because these kids are. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> these kids are out, you know being crazy and finding themselves in the conservative America, and you know, America just can't stand for that. Um, but more poignantly so, it was based off a true story of something that happened to kids in his town. And that ended up in Doom. So that's kind of how it became the Doom generation. Well, like I told you outside, like this was the movie, you know, when I went to see it, my circle of friends, this was the first movie I saw where I really literally felt like that's, that's us, like reflected in a movie. And that was why it was so formative. We just kept going back and seeing it over and over. And so it's always been so grateful for the moment he captured in this film, in music, in style, the, and how LA it is with, I don't know if you heard me cheer back there when Perry Farrell was on screen, but there's a lot of LA sort of heroes in this movie, Perry Farrell. Heidi Fleiss, if you consider her a hero. Uh, she know. is to some. <laughs> Nikki Cat, I mean, just all these incredible Parker Posey, I heard you guys watch it. Who's got, like, you know, one of the great lines. That's one of the great lines. We, I mean, yeah. the response to Doom, because Doom was our first big movie, you know, for Totally Fucked Up, we did it on a very small budget. And his other movies, as we were speaking before, he had three movies before Totally Fucked Up. So The Living End, most of you might know, but I don't think most of you know The Three Bewildered People in the Night, his very first movie, or The Long Weekend of Despair. Um, so he was writing these gay movies in the late 80s and early 90s, and certainly, the, I don't know if anyone here has seen The Living End, for example, <laughs> part of the queer new wave that broke out, but yeah, that's a dynamically awesome film that has all the trimmings of an action film. And this producer had come up to Greg and he said, you know, you make these crazy, crazy movies for like gay people. Like, if you, I'll give you a lot of money if you can make a movie like that, like, but heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg was like, I'll make the gayest heterosexual movie I've ever seen. <laughs> and that is literally sort of how the whole story for Doom came up. And he was like, I got something for you. That sexual tension, and then something breaks it up every time. Yeah, well, you know, one of our favorite stories, like someone came up to Greg one time, and was just sort of like, "I saw Doom Generation, and it made me, it made me go gay." <laughs> and we're like, "Well, then our job is done." <laughs> so I have more questions, but I do want to turn it over to the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions? For James Duvall, yes, right over here on the left. Ooh, that's tough. It's either it's he's got to be either this or nowhere, or you know. But Donnie Darko's got to be. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe nowhere, but only because that has more songs in it than all of the other movies together. There's probably twice as many as this. <laughs> Are there any fellow Splendor fans out there? Am I the only one that loves Splendor? Okay, good. All right, one, two, all right, cool. <laughs> I feel like Splendor never gets brought up. It's Splendor, well, like Splendor, it. Splendor will come. They will eventually get to Splendor, and then it's a mysterious skin afterwards and smiley face. <laughs> But I, as far as I understand, he's in the middle of working on Nowhere Now, and then he's going to go back to Three Bewildered People. So for you, those of you who are, uh, who are true fans, which I think is most of you, check out Three Bewildered People in the Night. Because that soundtrack is also fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, to, the soundtracks to all his movies are unbelievable. Yeah. And, the, and the testament to Greg and when we met is because, and I'm sure it's like that for most of you here, is we live our lives by these soundtracks. This was, I mean, this soundtrack was one of my all-time, it was just a study, like, in the car, on disc, right, back in the day. Um, Non-stop, it's one of the best soundtracks, if you guys don't have it. The soundtrack and the mindset of our characters.
So he really has, you know, detailed, intricate idea specifically of what he's looking for and what he wants. That's awesome. So I have a question. So Doom Generation comes out, Total Vans. Two years later, you do Nowhere. In the middle, you do a little movie called Independence Day. <laughs> How did that happen? Because I remember seeing Independence Day, and I'm like, it's, it's Doom Generation, it's Jordan! Like, it just blew me away to see you in this huge movie. And I love that you went right back to doing indies and doing another big Rocky movie, but just like, how did that happen? Because it just went from one right to the other, it seemed like. That's a really interesting story, too, believe it or not. So I met Gregor Rocky in a cafe and started making, and became an actor and started making movies from there. But when I was like, okay, I'm going to become an actor now, I saw Totally Fucked Up, I had done Doom Generation, I had, it's like, okay, I think I can try to do this now. So I got a job as, an, as a waiter in a restaurant. And, the way, and, the, and one day I remember it was this French restaurant in Hollywood called La Poubelle. And yeah, which means the trash or the garbage or the, <laughs> the wastebasket. And the, oh, God bless her soul, I love Jackie, the owner. But she used to come up. She's always a very excited French woman, you know, with a big French accent. Like, she needs you know, these very big uh, Hollywood directors. Um, I want you to fix your table. Uh, and like, Jackie, look, I'm not here to smooth with your customers, okay? Right now, I'm just an act. I mean, I'm a waiter, so I need to be the best waiter you have because I suck as a waiter. So I need to work really hard at this. I need to concentrate. And I walked up to their table, and I had a poster of Totally Fucked Up on the door that they put up for me. And it hadn't come out yet, but it played at Sundance. And I walked up to the table and started to take their order, and the director, Roland, you know, from Independence Day Stargate, looked at me and he said, Oh, wait, that's, that's you on that totally fucked up. You did the Greg Rocky movie. I'm like, well, yeah, how did you see that? And he's like, well, I was at Sundance. I always go to Sundance. I love The Living End. I love Greg Rocky's movies. I, wow, I thought you were great in that. So are you still acting? I was like, well, yeah. Can I take your order? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was so, and, then, and then it was really kind of matter of fact. It was like, well, I, you know, and I think this is right after Stargate came out. So it was December 94. And uh, it was him and Dean Devlin, and they said, well, do you have anything else going on? And I'm like, well, it turns out I have another movie with that filmmaker named Doom Generation, going to play at Sundance this year. Maybe we'll see you there. And he's like, yeah, maybe we'll see you there. And I just, you know, I gave him his food, did the table thing, didn't think anything of it. Then we do the Sundance Film Festival, and I'm walking down to do the Q&A, like, kind of like I came down tonight. But at the very top, you know, at the, I'll, I'll, say, I'll first say this. After we screened this movie in 95, at the end of it, it was silent. <laughs> it was like, people just didn't know how to react. And it was, uh, and, you know, we all took a deep breath because we were, like, bracing ourselves, you know, for, for who knows what. And I remember, just as I was about to walk down, he taps on me, and I look, and it's Roland Emmerich sitting, at, and he looks at me and just goes, Oh, Jimmy, oh my God. <laughs> like, well, I won't be working with him. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, and, and when... Well, yeah, and he did the Q&A, went back to L.A., and he didn't come back into the restaurant. And three weeks later, after I forgot all about it, he came back in with Dean, and was sort of like, Jimmy, wow, that was just a crazy movie. That's a crazy movie. <laughs> look, look, sorry we haven't been in touch, but we were in Mexico. We just wrote this script, this tiny movie called Independence Day. In fact, it's Dean's idea. What are you doing this summer? Because you'd be great for one of the parts. And then I'm sort of, well, okay, well, turns out I'm doing another movie with Craig Rocky called Nowhere, and I'll be booked for that, but maybe we can make it all work out. And he sent me, sent out for me, called me for an audition. I went and did the audition and then decided that he wanted to cast me. And then I almost didn't do Independence Day, but Greg and Roland really wanted to make it work. So there was a big actor, I think it was Scott Glenn, and his schedule was conflicting with mine. And so they ended up not going with him and they went with Robert Loggia, God rest his soul, from Scarface, who plays the lovable general in Independence Day and gave me the part. And so the way that ended up working out was I filmed one week in LA on Nowhere, then I took my earrings out and switched my part and <laughs> shot for a week in Utah on Independence Day and then put my earrings back in and came and shot a week on Nowhere and then Finished Independence Day in Utah, then finished Nowhere in LA, and then finished Independence Day. And so it's kind of, I actually shot them at the same time. But I remember after that, when it, 
One more, I was actually shooting it and Doom Generation came out and the reviews started coming out about how crazy this movie was. And Roland was dancing on the, like on all past the trailers, like, oh, I got the guy from Doom Generation. <laughs> he was so happy that it was such as this thorn in Hollywood's side. And at that time, doing this big Hollywood movie, all I could think was, I think I'm in the right place, only in the sense that he, the reason, part of the reason I'm in this movie is because of his love for Gregor Rocky and Greg's movies. And having a character like that in his movies was something, you know, especially which you, which you can see now in his later works, was something that he'd always wanted, but was very much a commercial filmmaker and wasn't at that point moving in that, quite in that direction yet. That's awesome. So sorry to be so long with it, but this is a crazy <laughs> story. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it, I remember I just, I was kind of freaked out after the world tour for Independence Day. Because it's as big as a get private jets and meeting like mayors of Berlin. It was wild. And um, I'm just a normal down to earth guy, you know. So I remember that for the tour. I was just like, look, I mean, these big movies are great and I'll do them, but I really want to focus on making little movies that mean something to me. I don't need to be a millionaire and live in a mansion. I just need to be happy. We were talking a little bit outside, I mean, between, I mean, and there's some of this May, but I mean, between this, for me, like this, Donnie Darko, and SLC Punk. Wow. These are three movies that, that people really deeply love, you know, that are also informed by music and scenes of music. And is that something that you, with intent, to go for? Like, when you're auditioning, do you look for projects like that? Because it, it, it's, they're just, beyond the fact that they're cult classics, and they've got this cult following, they are informed in, in a big way by music. And, and I'm wondering if that's something you gravitate for. I, I definitely gravitate that towards that more than anything, I think, just because it's my formative years and the way I was raised when I started be, you know, acting with Greg and all throughout the 90s was very much in that style. I saw C-Punk oh. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, so yeah, we got a little <laughs> Q&A and give out some pins today. So, so, they're falling out of my pocket. But yeah, you know, music music has always been the central key for me. With with Donnie Darko, I just got lucky, to be honest. I had seen this movie called Rushmore, and I love Jason Schwartzman. Yeah, and I was like, I want to give me a movie, give me an audition with this kid from Rushmore. I really want to do a movie with him. I'm like, okay, Donnie Darko, got you this movie, Donnie Darko, and he was cast as Donnie Darko. And I went in an audition for Donnie Darko, and I got the part for Frank, and then he dropped out. Um, from a scheduling conflict. But he, he was very helpful in the sense that I think he brought on Alex Greenwald from Phantom Planet, who plays the bully, um, who was awesome and very supportive of the film. And then, of course, we got Jake, who you all might have heard of, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> and, you know, I remember filming the first scene with Jake on the golf course and just kind of looking at me like that. And at the end, I took the mask off. I'm like, oh, you Donnie Darko. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be anyone else. I love Jason Schwartzman, but it's like I can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes anyone, but yeah. I mean, because some, so sometimes I also try to pick scripts, you know, not even necessarily for the roles, but for who's involved or who's making it, you know, because I know throughout my career I've always gotten, oh, what's your ideal role? Like, what would you love to play? And then you get the script and you're like, wow, this fucking sucks. <laughs> and then you get something where like, oh, there's just this. Gardner, and he's like, oh, this sounds fucking horrible. And you read it, and you're like, I have to play this. I have to play this. So then it ends up being in the content of the writing, and not and what I thought the role was, like struggling lawyer, or a drug addict doctor, or like, no. You know, it's, 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 it's really more about this, the conflict, and I think the journey of the character, that's what I've become most attracted to. And, you know, again, I think you can see it in Doom. With all of Greg's movies and being raised with Greg, it was like, your characters have to start somewhere and they have to go through something and they have to end up somewhere else. And it's a bit, that's what I look for, more than anything. And then I'm just gonna totally fuck you over in the end, like with Nowhere to you, where it's like, why? These yeah. movies so mean to Jimmy Duvall, but whatever. <laughs> that, that was supposed to be a series, believe it or not. And nobody wanted to touch it. Yeah, we, it for H we wrote it for HBO and then HBO was like, mm-mm. <laughs> Wow. Mm. You know, now they're doing Euphoria, but, <laughs> which is all, I love it, but you know, we tried to bring them nowhere. You know, we made the movie and the movie was supposed to be a pilot, and I have episode two. And there is an episode, I think there's an episode three and a four that he ended up writing. 
and I'm still trying to get out of him. Yeah, but maybe maybe I'll save I'll save some of that that nowhere trivia for when we come back through from nowhere. I tried to get Nathan Bexton to come back for nowhere. Oh yeah, all right, we're good. Nathan Bexton from the Casa Sin Casa. So he couldn't make it, but he said to send everybody here his love. And right if you'd be kind enough to show nowhere, he will be here for that. Can we see it? Very cool. It's awesome. We're looking back. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm happy to get yeah, over here. but it also created camaraderie between us, if that makes any sense. Because I think the thing, the thing is, is and, and Greg and I have spoken about this at length in the last few months while we've been touring with the movie, is it's a lot more sexual than what we really are, were doing. The way we film it, the way we perform it, the simulation, a lot of it's below screen, like it's cut off here, so you actually don't. Like for example, one of the things I love is when I'm reading Greg's scripts and he says, you know, like, for instance, when we're having sex in the bathtub and we're losing our virginity and X is watching us and he starts to masturbate. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, when you're reading it in the script, it's like, so X is watching and he reaches and he slowly goes down his torso and he reaches down into his pants and grabs his off-screen cock. Off-screen, of course, because this is a family film. <laughs> And it's written into the script. <laughs> so you're reading this thing, two things together, you're like, oh, this is gonna be great, this is gonna be great. Um, you were older when you made I was 21 when I made this. I was 18 when I made Totally Fucked Up, and 21 here, and 22 for Nowhere. It's amazing, it's amazing. The great films of 22, that's amazing. And in Pensa. Uh Yeah, I hope that answers the question. You're welcome. Well, I know at one point Greg was like, fuck! <laughs> but, but, at the same time, it's like, we knew when we made the movie we weren't making something that was going to be a movie for everybody. Um, and we still know that, which is why, to be quite honest, the fact that it's even sold out here tonight for us, we always felt that we were making a movie for particular audiences. And, you know, so we understood why some people were offended by us and didn't like us and got mad. Some people were going to come along and capitalize on what we were doing. Um, but as filmmakers, you know, it becomes, I think it's much more important, you know, to not really focus on those sorts of things. You just focus on what you want to make and just keep making them. Like the, I, I think certainly like one of the things that Greg and I have been talking about over and over in the last few months is, how much harder it is in some ways to make your movies. I mean, it's easier because the technology's there, so everybody can make one. But it's a lot more difficult to get it out there because you have so much more to to weed through and for to try to get distribution for the distributors to get it out there. And, you know, everybody's trying to follow some fad or what's you know this is the type of movies that are in right now, so this is the only type of movies we want to make. And you have to decide for yourselves as filmmakers or artists, painters, musicians, writers, whatever it is you do, that what you make, you make because it's an expression of you and it's something you just have to put out. And hopefully some people get it, but if they don't, that's, that's all right, because you're just going to keep making it. And if I can, real quick before I do the next question, I really have to say, you guys saw the trailer for Moon Garden. Uh, I saw the screener for last month, and I have not fallen that hard for a movie in a long, long time. Like, come back and check out that movie. That's not a shameless plug. It's just that freaking amazing. So, if you see one movie here in the next few months, check out Moon Garden. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people watch this movie because it's the media. So what is the 4K coming out? So, it should be out on Criterion in the next month. It's out now. Oh, it's out on Criterion now. And um, I know that the Blu-ray is coming very soon. I think Greg said the next few months. Possibly. Um, he's so proud of this cut that you just saw. It's never looked like this, not even when we originally made it. It's never sounded like this, certainly. And when they did the transfer over to the VHS, 
a lot of the sound quality was lost. Of course, it was like in a pan and scan and widescreen. So Greg was kind of always, you know, it was kind of a bittersweet thing for him. We were happy that it was out, but it was kind of a thorn. Um, there was also this R-rated cut. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. That was floating around. That is offensive because of everything that they cut out to. Because basically, when we screened the film for the MPAA back in the '90s, they said that they found the whole basic tone of the film offensive. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to get an R rating, because we were never trying to get R rating, it couldn't. It just had to be non-rated. And you know. For distribution, you have a blockbuster cut. It has to have a rated R cut. So they went and just started butchering it and cutting it and cutting it and cutting it and cutting it until, like, I think they cut 20 minutes out of this movie. So you have these... The, the movie doesn't quite make sense. They're offended by the sex, yet the whole scene when we're in the black and white hotel room and she's like, pull it out, hit it against your knee, throw it against the roof. Like, they cut, they cut all that <laughs> They cut all that stuff out. You know, when we're talking about sex, and it's really actually a sweet, you know, moment of bonding before it gets sexual. You know? They just cut right to the sex. And, and it, 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 we found the whole thing, I know I do too, not, I'm not as offended as him, but, you know, I find the whole thing to be quite baffling. He finds the whole thing to be quite offensive. And then even the version that, that came out that wasn't the R-rated version, had things removed. Like for, for, for those of you who like seen this movie a million times and were like, I don't quite remember seeing Jordan's dick in that guy's hand. You oh, have we haven't, right? Yeah, unless you were at Sundance. Unless you were at Sundance. Yeah. So one of the first things that after we screened it at Sundance is Samuel Goldwyn picked us up and they said, We'll pick up your movie, but you gotta cut that out. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> and Greg cut it out and by the time we got to Toronto six months later, it still wasn't enough. They were still so freaked out by it, they just sold us overnight to Trimark. And, you know, Trimark did do a little push, but it was disheartening for us to get picked up by a big studio like Samuel Goldwyn and then for, us to drop, for them to drop us and get kind of relegated to, you know, as kind of, no offense to Trimark, but like this kind of backwater distribution company. Um, you know, that being said, we couldn't be happier, and I know this, I'm speaking for Greg when I say this, so all of you who've seen this on a Russian bootleg or lent out those tapes until they wore out, made copies of those copies, we are eternally grateful to you. So thank you. We love you. And we now have this beautiful new cut for you. Yeah. It's, 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 I'm, just so, it's, I'm, so happy. I'm so happy that you guys got to see it. I'm happy that we can screen it. It's going to be a staple here. Uh, we have like a certain level of blue gold that we play like once a year. We have like these certain list of films that just keep coming back because we just want to share them to new it's audiences. A, new it's an honor to be a part of the honestly being yeah. listed with those movies. You know, Blue Velvet, yeah. for instance, like David Lynch is one of Greg's biggest you know, inspirations. Yeah. So, after, so tell us about the buttons you got. I've got some buttons here you may have seen Amy wearing in the movie that Eat, Fuck, Kill. Ah! So, yeah, we've got a handful, so we'll just do a little trivia thing uh, between Logan and I. We'll just start asking questions, and uh, if you know the answers, we'll give you a button. Maybe a Dorito. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. I'm... Okay, um, we've been asking this a lot, so ever seen the videos of us doing the Q and A? Might, but I just love this question because I love this song. What's the name of the Cocteau Twin song in the movie? Early Dewdrop Drops. Okay, um, yeah, well, raise your hand, but it's not Pearly Dew Dot Shops. Someone, was that Bluebeard? Not Bluebeard. Not Bluebeard. Summer Summerlight. Right on. It's, on. it's the B side of Bluebeard, I think. Uh, it's my turn, all right. What is the name of the slow dive song that plays at the end? Yes. Blue Sky and Cleared. That's right on. And so actually, yeah, so the next one will be Slow Dive has two songs in the soundtrack. <laughs> so, so you guys have two songs in the soundtrack. There's two other bands that have two songs in the soundtrack. Just name one of them. Wait, um, but call it, you want to pick something? I just whoever shouted it out. So, Jesus and Mary Chain, that's one of them, yep. So, that's one of them, but I will give you a second chance. There's one more band that has two. Right. That's the second one, yeah. 
Yeah. All right. This is cool. That's fun. Craig just chucks them out. He's like, here! Anyone over 40 here? All right. So, there's a news... There's two newscasters in the film. The male newscaster is from a very, very famous 19... Yes! Brady Bunch! You said Brady Bunch over here. Someone said Brady Bunch. All right, you said Brady Bunch. Right there, right over there. Can you name him? You'll get the button anyway, but... Was it Chris Knight? Chris Knight, yeah. Chris Knight, yes. Very cool. Peter Brady. You got quite a lot of very interesting cameos in this Yeah, film. well, we have a Brady in nowhere. I don't know if I should make this a trivia question. Anyone know who that is? Jam Brady, that's right. You get a pin too. And you get a pin. So who who answered the who was it? Over here. Uh, someone had the right answer here. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm. All right, come on, what's what's a little bit another one? Let me see. We have some well there's some super hard ones. We can ask okay. we, we can also ask Greg Rocky questions, no yeah. questions are okay. Uh, uh, here's, here's one because you barely see her face, so you kinda have to like be in the know on this one. But the, at the liquor store, who plays the wife that comes running Yes, yeah, so Margaret, Margaret Cho, right here. Very cool. Margaret I just finished doing a movie with Margaret a couple years ago. <laughs> that was here for the Film Thread Awards. We won the best what the fuck of the movie is this of, anyways, of the year movie. Oh, that's right, is that the one that we won here, right? Yeah, I, ch I challenged her was with, like, with uh, Margaret. Oh, she's fucking great. Okay, I got one, all right. So, there's a very, uh, there's a few characters in this film who say, the bitch, I'm gonna find her, and I'm gonna kill her. Yes. That's not the answer. The question, that's not the question. The question is, that line is a reference by a song by what band? Throw a coal. Throw a coal. Right over here. Where was that? Right over here. Well done. This is fun. Great great band. Band. Movie trivia. Great great music trivia, really. <laughs> Cocktail <laughs> Twins t shirt. Nice t shirt, sir. I love your shirt. All right. Your turn. I, I'm, I've got to think of one. How many more pins do you have? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got at least four. Alright, alright, alright. Well, that's Pizza 5, but I already have a bunch. <laughs> um, so, who's the bartender in the scene with Parker Posey? That's right, Amanda Beers. <laughs> we were so jazzed to have her that night. Like, it was her and Parker in the same place. All right, there's a really tough one I don't think anyone's going to get, but I'll ask it anyways. Because some of the things is, uh, you couldn't, there were, there were things that Greg and I didn't notice until we saw the re restoration, the 4K restoration. Like, oh wow, you can read that bumper sticker now. Oh, you can see so-and-so's face. So in the very opening of the movie, there's an actor from Totally Fucked Up behind me being kind of like eaten by a man and a woman while he's like, Sexually, not not literally. Right, right behind me, but there's an actor from Totally Fucked Up. Do you know which actor that is? Most people. It's a tough one. It's Lance May who played who plays Steven's brother in Totally Fucked Up. Oh, I didn't recognize him. Yeah. Oh, that's wild. I have. <laughs> we, we got like well, this would be a nowhere one, but who? Okay, so in nowhere, there's a character named Handjob. <laughs> yeah, he plays my lover and totally fucked up. Yeah, it's Alan. That's the actor Alan Boyce who starred in um, started a movie with Keanu Reeves. Uh, we made a script for that now, but uh, I was really jazzed. No, it was before that. It was after what we said. Lou Reed's in it. I can't remember. My friend plays the be Keanu's best friend who commits suicide. I, I thought it went now. Okay. In Nowhere, there is a 90s pop music heartthrob in the film with a short lived musical career. Oh, Jeremy yes. Jordan. Jeremy Jordan. Wow. Yeah, Jeremy Jordan. That's that it. Counts. That's incredible. 
All right, yeah, that's that's. I'll, I'll take it over. I'll take it over. You come up with the next one. All right. So let's see. What's what's the what's another good question from Jeremy Jordan? Um, actually, do that. <laughs> Back to Twins T-shirt guy. Right on. Here you go. Uh, While he's thinking, any other questions? For him? Yes, right over there. He, well, that's a great question because Greg is very particular with his dialogue, but at the same time, he's extremely collaborative. So it was the entire experience for me from the beginning, even to now, I still feel like we collaborate every time we get together. I know, you know, for, for Kaboom, for instance, I had an inkling he was making something because we were sitting eating and he just looked at me and goes, I don't know, Jimmy, what, what, what kind of guy do you, what do you want to play? And I'm like, I don't know, I guess I want to do some, like, people think I'm homeless, I'm like an undercover agent or something. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I ended up as the Messiah of Kaboom. <laughs> So there's, he certainly kind of, you know, I can say that a, probably a, a lot of the early dialogue in Doom Generation Nowhere comes from me, too. So, ball liquor and nut liquor, that <laughs> somehow became me, but that's what I used to use. <laughs> I, I'm curious to know, like, with the resurgence of these films and them being kind of brought back into the conversation, is, has, has there been any conversation about, is it inspiring anything, Greg, to sort of, return to this aesthetic or to, you know, to, to recall that sort of... Oh yeah, I mean, well, you know, Kabo Kaboom was the first, I think, time we had kind of gone back to the, this universe. But more recently, I don't know if any of you have had seen Now Apocalypse on Stars. Woo! But that, Now Apocalypse was the return. There was a second season of that that's been written. And hopefully, I mean, it's still not out of the question that it still may come back if we can get some financing. Right so um, we were ready to do the second season and Stars pulled the plug on us because the guy who brought us on got fired. Um, but uh, I, like I said, yeah, I think there's still a good chance that now Apocalypse can still come back for a second season as well as Greg is constantly, he's very prolific, so he's constantly writing and has many, many things in the works. Many, many, you know, he's certainly, some roles that I'm too old for now, but he's attached me to stuff in the past that just never got made. Like one was called uh, The Separation of the Earth Off Its Axis. Yeah, unfortunately, never made that. I just saw the script in the picture. I'm like, oh, he's got the script. Oh, he's got, he wants me to do it. And he never sent it to me. <laughs> well, it never got made. It never, in all honesty, he made other, he ended up making great movies. You got time so, for a few more? I do. God bless. All right. Yes. I, I have, and Greg has, and one of the things that I think has been incredible when I met Greg, because he's you know 10 years older than me, was he always had this youthful mindset. He still has it, and uh, I think I, I like to think I do too. So I, you know, I'm much I'm much older, but I still kind of live like I'm you know in my 20s. And I think I think Greg does too. So we're still of the very much of the same mindset we've always kind of been. I think the only difference for us, I know sometimes it's like, we make these crazy movies, and yeah, I think, you know, I was saying this before, I'm like, we're strangely well-adjusted. <laughs> we're strangely well-adjusted, but, you know, I think, you know, we got lucky. It was a different time, you know, and a lot of the things that, you know, I mean, we've certainly made some strides, but a lot of the things that we were afraid of, that we were fighting against have come full circle and are back in front of us, unfortunately. So this is why it's more important to add than ever to keep your voice loud and proud and strong. It's fly, I mean, we don't see ourselves as Well, that, that's a really good question. Um, 
because Greg and I were talking at length about this in San Francisco just a couple weeks ago, because um, we're always, in, in, for us, it's the most incredible thing to hear about, you know, when someone's made a movie that's moved them so much, and if it's been a movie that we've made, we're, I, it's, it's really quite mind-blowing, because I know for, for Greg and I, what we're moved by is actually music. So all the characters and lines come from the bands and songs, and it's sort of the same for me. Um, you know, ever since, you know, working with Greg, every time I make a movie and create a character, I have a soundtrack for him. So where we find a lot of our motivations, our inspiration comes from all the punk rock, industrial music, alternative music. Um, for instance, like this movie is a lot more industrial, you know, so this movie is a bit angrier, I think, a little bit more, like has a little bit more growth than Nowhere. But nowhere certainly has, you know, I think it's got this energy to it, but it's, it's, it's not as industrial as this movie, if that kind of makes sense. But, um, yeah, we've, you know, it's in, the, in music, I think, before even movies or anything where people will call out sexuality or call out social, you know, issues, before anybody would even, re they'd be singing along not realizing what they're saying. It was the idea that you could be that subversive there. And there were you, there's an arena where we could be free and really kind of get away with it for, we think, a much longer time. Um, so, yeah, you know, I know, I know for us it, it literally does come from the music. So, you know, going back into the question before with collaboration, when Greg and I talk about characters, when we talk about when we talk about songs and the situations in songs and the lyrics in songs and the way it makes us feel. And, you know, we were kind of, you know, Logan and I were speaking about the way the soundtrack to Robin Guthrie from Cocteau Twins' soundtrack in Serious Skin kind of brings this whole other dimension to the film and how music moves and affects us like that. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's almost like we take this, what we film musically and put it, push it into the cinema, film genre, and, you know, try to make this visual meaning of what we feel, what we hear. Too, I mean, like as, as what's that? Well, just to clarify, yeah. like, so Smiths would be one, Skinny Puppy would be another one. Uh, bands that we, you know, had looked up to, and still, like The Cure is another one. Still got it. You guys hear that? <laughs> oh my God. That new Cure is unbelievable. <laughs> it's so good. I was online, like, like Craig. We we couldn't go to the. May 23rd show, so Greg sent it to me, someone put it on YouTube. And even though we weren't in the same room, like we were bawling while we were this. Like there's a new song on there called, um, there's six new songs on there. And one in particular called uh, The Last Goodbye, or The Last Goodbye, Nothing Like Goodbye. It's, it, I can never say goodbye. I can never say goodbye. That. I, I, halfway through that, I just couldn't stop crying. I couldn't, I was so moved, I couldn't stop crying. And that was the first time I heard it, and I'm listening to it live. And so that, in particular, are where we find like our heroes or icons in those moments. Someone who can make you feel that way. Really just penetrate right in the core. Like, you just pop it on, I haven't seen it, it's in the cure, and I don't know, like, it's Coachella. And all of a sudden, I'm weeping openly, <laughs> profuse, profusely. From, five, ten minutes, every song, I'm like, oh my god, he did it again. <laughs> well, I think I, what you're describing that was captured in this movie, like, when she's looking at the Thrill Pole album, you she know. She misses her record collection. She misses her record collection, and, and I mean, that, you know, it, it, if you're a fan, you can relate to that, but, and that specific album, too. I mean, and that, that I think is like, you know, going back to icons, like, at, when this movie came out, like, Rocky, uh, Todd Haynes, I mean, they were my icons at the moment. And because there weren't a lot of films that were coming out that, that, that were not only queer, but also stylistically subversive. And, and, and you know, the, the Sunset Five, which I referenced earlier, you know, you had to go find those movies. You would not see them in Redondo Beach where I grew up or Torrance, you know. You yeah, that's where I, where I grew up. It was, you know, it was a lot, you know, I, I'm, I'm so glad I was doing it with Craig because you know, I can definitely say, like, if we were talking about cinema icons, for Greg and myself, one of them would be Godard. Mm -hmm. It would definitely be one. 
And it was in film school that when one of the courses Greg was in, they gave him Godard, and all of a sudden something woke up in him, masculine and feminine in particular. And uh, it changed, it not just inspired, but it changed his style of filmmaking into what we see today and how you know formative that was for him. And then, of course, once we started working with him, it was the same thing after we did Doom Generation Before Nowhere, we did a little film short that no one's ever seen with Jordan Ladd and Greg's boyfriend at the time called There Is No Time For Dreaming. And he made cassettes for us on that as well. And then we sat and watched Jim Jarmusch movies and we watched some Godard. So we did have homework in that sense before we made these movies, before we got on set with each other. So if you love music, like what's the thing you do? You have your friends come over and you listen to music and you drink or smoke or you go out and you drink and smoke and listen to music. But it's music is almost always involved. You know, go, like we were just all in Cruel World together, you know, running from band to band. And, uh, yeah, but it's all music seems to be the backdrop of everything. Yeah. Well, and again, like the, you know, going back to the theaters too, and Sunset Five is long gone, the Bijou, which was in her mouth, so our song, the art house songs is long gone, and so, it, it is just surreal to just come full circle and, and keep that format alive. And I, I say it all the time, it's all of y'all, keep the Frida going because it's it's exciting to be able to have survived the pandemic and, and to be an art house that's still going, to keep movies like these on screen because there's new generations. It's not, you know, the, the audiences that I, I'm always excited to share movies like this with is, is really those of you who've seen it a million times but, but miss the opportunity to see it in the community people and seeing on the big screen, but really those of you who've never seen it, like it's Which not the is. same to see a movie like this on TV, uh, at home or on your phone, or on, as it is to be in a sold out crowd. So fucking A, thank you all. Yeah, especially, especially for some, you know, I've always, you know, when I started off and I've always been proud to, you know, come from the school of Greater Rocky. Um, but there is something also important, like you say, to preserve these films and to preserve these genres, you know. I know when The Living End came out, which is another, like, oh, God, I really love that movie, but, you know, Todd Haynes had Poison and Tom Kalen had Swoon and Alice Nanders had, you know, uh, Gas Food and Lodging. And you had these independent filmmakers who were breaking out and making these movies about a world that they lived in, where they saw things that moved them. And in turn, because they were honest about it, when we watched it, we were moved and we connected. And so that's the idea to never lose a hold of, because I'm sure you're all hearing about the writer's strike and the actors are just about to join. And it isn't just about money, it's about AI. It's about not preserving any of this stuff anymore. It's putting it in a computer and spitting out the results. And we'll lose, we'll lose our humanity, we'll lose our heart, we'll lose our soul like that. You have a computer writing your scripts, computer making your music, computer singing your songs. I mean, you'll get something, but you won't get something like this. <laughs> and yes, right there. For a long time, it was Andy from Totally Fucked Up. But then I don't want to say that I connected with him completely because he ends up killing himself. <laughs> and I did end up finding, yeah, I did end up finding salvation. I think probably if I was closest to any of them would be dark. That monologue that I have at the end of nowhere is, I used to say that to Greg a lot. So I wasn't really completely surprised I had this monologue about, because it was, it, it still, I think it, and then this, where in the sense it hasn't changed from generation to generation. I mean, who doesn't want to find at least one person to love you that you can love? And let it be that simple. So why is that so fucking hard? You know what I mean? And that's a universal, I think, you know, issue that we all deal with and face. And you know, you have that love and you find it, and you realize it, and you lose it, or you have it, and you find it, and you never realize it. Well, that, that happens in nowhere, which no spoilers, but that can happen to you, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 like to look, I like to look at, you know, I like for me, Doom Generation Two and Nowhere and totally fucked up. Like someone was asking how to, how I would, you know classify those as a genre, like those are, it's, it's simple, they're coming of age movies. These are coming of age movies, they're just not coming of age movies for Apple Pie America. <laughs> Pretty much, they're not. It's a coming of age for those of us who, that wasn't our coming of age. Well, 
have time for a couple more. Thank you for staying so late with this one. That's awesome. Oh, thank you for having me. I think I have a couple more buttons. Oh, sweet. Uh, right here. Someone had their hand up right around, right around here. All right, right here. With, uh, oh, it's, yes. It's it's a new print, but that that shirt does still exist. So it's pretty much every shirt I wear is totally fucked up, and my ministry shirt and Doom Generation are all Greg's shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so he still has us. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I haven't been. I've been. Yeah. Yes. I thought the yo-yo scene was kind of important. Do you still don't want to play a yo-yo? Or do you still <laughs> yeah, I actually have that. I have. That. I, yeah, I had a fan at the New Art Theater come and bring me that exact yo-yo in that box. Yeah, so I don't have it here, but I know that someone took video footage, so when I, they called me on stage, I came up with the yo-yo. Oh, dude, thank you. Speaking of, where where did you, sh the, the really sort of eraser-heavy industrial, like, the smoke, and you're just walking, where was that shot? That is heartbreaking. That was shot at a drive-in theater that they were demolishing. So all those were big piles of, you know, those drive-in theaters had the big, you know, the big concrete waves for you to park your car. So all those who got torn up and were just piled up high and asked all these huge, empty... Ma it was a massive lot. It was an old abandoned morning. driving that was being torn down. Yeah, end of an era. That will have more residents now. <laughs> yeah. Last Later. question. What? Last question. Is it last question time? Last question, yes. Uh, all right, right over here. Uh, what band are you <clears throat> What's, what's up, my, um, well, Love and Rockets, literally, I just got it two days ago, well, I got it yesterday. Love and Rockets had an album called Sweet F.A., and believe it or not, even though it comes out on the 9th, I pre-ordered it, I'm also friends with the, with the guys, so I ended up getting a copy of something called My Dark Twin, and it's a two-CD compilation of 12 unheard songs from the sessions that no one's ever heard, and then another 10 different versions of songs that no one's ever heard. And so I'm grooving pretty hard on that new Love and Rockets right now. Um, there's also this other kind of, uh, it's kind of dream pop shoegaze band called The Motifs. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of The Motifs. Also, Ariel. Ariel, goddamn. Yeah, yeah they, just, they were just here on tour, so Ariel, I'm grooving a lot on Ariel right now. And there's another band that was touring with Ariel a couple years ago that I've become quite fond of called Topographies. You guys know them? It's, it's the son of one of the guys from The Cure, and the band is unbelievable. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's really actually, like I said, music's so big for me. So I'm also, there's a band out of Ireland called The Clockworks that I'm a really big fan of. Yeah, I love The Clockworks. Um, God. Were you at the Ariel show? At the Did you make the Ariel show in LA? Like, Yo, yeah, I was there. Oh yeah, I definitely I wouldn't miss that for the world. Awesome. Yeah. I had to go see Jeremy. Okay, so we got the last question alert, but I know you have a couple more pets. You want any more trivia? Are we are we good for the evening? What do you think? I know. I thought it was just for the evening. I'm good. You're good. Okay, let's do uh, do another couple of trivia. Get your buttons away, and then we'll call it night. How's that sound? Yeah. All right. Cool. Nice. So, shoot. Um, we'll ask a no word question. Um. Okay, I just want to give the pins away, so I'm not going to make them super hard. Um, what TV show is the Teen Idol from in Nowhere? It was from a famous, famous TV show. That's one of them. I'll, I'll take that. But the, the, the Teen Idol that rapes Egg. What sh Baywatch, that was it. So Baywatch was one. Who said Baywatch? James! <laughs> this is my friend James. <laughs> I didn't even see him till just now. And who said 90210? You know what? <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Uh, it's all good. Folks, <laughs> one more time for Jimmy Duvall here. <laughs> this is the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right on. So you'll be back for nowhere. 
Yeah, I'll be back Sweet. for Nowhere, so we hope to see you all here. And when I come back for Nowhere, maybe I'll have Greg, but I guarantee you I'll at least have Nathan Bexton, or perhaps Rachel True. Or I'll, I'll go drag some of the Nowhere people out with you. And I know that they're eager and waiting to come out and meet you all once we have the re-release ready to go. Very cool. Everyone, thanks for being here. Have a very, very good day. Thank you. That'll be 666, dude. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.